Welcome to Amusing Jews, where we celebrate Jewish contributors and contributions to American popular culture. I'm Jonathan Friedman. And I'm Joey Angelfield. Producer engineer Mike Tomrin is working somewhere behind the scenes. Amusing Jews is a project of Adad Chavarim, Congregation for Humanistic Judaism, the Cool Shul Jewish Cultural Community, and Atheist United Studios. Hey, Joey. Mark Twain wrote in his autobiography, I have found that there is no ingredient of the human race which I do not possess in either a small way or a large way. When it is small, as compared with the same ingredient in somebody else, there is still enough of it for the purposes of examination. This awareness of our shared humanity is the key to good writing and good acting. Identifying the ingredients of the human race, especially in characters who are distinct from ourselves, is what makes these things work. I've always been a fan of character actors, performers who specialize in portraying colorful and offbeat supporting roles, the people you recognize from something else but might not be able to name. If these actors are keen observers of human nature, they can have long careers playing all kinds of people. And if they're really good at what they do, they could be like today's guest. We're overjoyed to chat with Stephen Tobolowski, who you might know as insurance agent Ned Ryerson in Groundhog Day, Commissioner Hugo Jerry on the HBO series Deadwood, Principal Earl Ball on the ABC series The Goldbergs, and a whole lot more. He also has a podcast, The Tobolowski Files, and is the author of three books, The Dangerous Animals Club, Cautionary Tales, and My Adventures with God. Stephen, welcome to Amusing Jews. It is so good to be here. You've played a variety of roles, uh, as we alluded to some of, uh, over the decades, including a serial killer, a white supremacist, and a dweeby insurance agent. Do you ever hear from fans who knew you from one role and then were shocked to see you playing someone completely different? Not quite. I kind of get the opposite. I, I get people who know me, but they don't know I'm an actor. You know, that I go different places. They think like, oh, this is the guy that waited on me. You know, when we were in New York at the Waldorf, he's the one who spilled the martini on me. Or uh, I, uh, one of the people I was, uh, their, their, <laughs> I was their teacher in elementary school. They remembered me. They, they, people remember me from all of these uh, different things. But I was in North Dakota. I was doing actually a book tour for my adventures with God in North Dakota. Yeah. And uh, I was at a restaurant and the waitress came up to me and says, you know something, you look just like that guy that's on TV. And I go, really? Yeah, I don't know who he is, but you look just like it. Spit an image. I, I go, well, Jesus, has anyone ever told you that before? I said, well, more or less, they told me that sometimes, and she goes away. Then I see her getting on the damn computer, and she's going on the computer, and she's like, Look. then she closes the computer, and she comes back and says, I got to tell you, you look just like it. In fact, you could probably make some money if you pretend to be this guy. And I go like, yeah, well, if, unless he arrests me, you know, it, it depends what I'm pretending to do. You're probably best known for playing needle-nosed Ned Ryerson in that brilliant 1993 fantasy uh, comedy Groundhog Day. You know, philosophers, theologians, spiritual practitioners, they've all claimed that movie as their own, as, as the, the highest expression of their core beliefs and their core philosophies. And you've lived with Groundhog Day for a long time. It's coming up on its 30th anniversary or it just had it, actually, I think. It just had it. I think, yeah, maybe 31. We're coming on 31. Oh. Yeah. Well, it all feels like one long day, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure uh, you've heard about people sort of finding this deep meaning in it, and maybe you've done the same, and maybe your view of its deeper meanings have changed over the years. Groundhog Day was a unique creative experience because we started the movie— and at the end, of, we were starting with a lot of the scenes of Bill and me in the street. And originally, I think in the script, there were like nine of those scenes, you know, here and there what, with, with different content in it. And Harold Ramis had not decided what the day of the movie was going to be because the day has to be exactly the same, right, meteorologically. So Bill and I not only had to do those scenes in the street, but we had to do them in every weather condition. 
and were shooting outside of Chicago in like January, so we had it all. So Bill and I were shooting those scenes in the snow, in the rain, in the sleet, in the gloom, in, in the every, just shooting those scenes over and over again. At the end of the first week was a huge scene. Probably, I want to say it took two days, something like that, which in terms of screen is huge, one scene taking that long. And it's when Bill discovers that he has no consequences and he tears up the end. He tears up the end. He, he takes spray paint, sprays up his room with graffiti, takes a chainsaw, starts cutting the furniture in half, takes a razor, cuts his hair into a mohawk. And everything you do in a movie, you have to redo for other takes and other camera angles. So every chair he saws in half, they had to have another chair. It was, it was something that took a great deal of money and a great deal of time. And it took a great deal of personal courage from Harold Ramis because what the big guys who give you the money are doing is they're watching this movie the first week to see what is our investment going to be like? What is our movie going to be? And so you have all the nutty Ned scenes, a bunch of Ned scenes that first week, and then you have this huge scene. Harold Ramis himself was wondering what this movie was going to be. And he talks to Danny Rubin, the screenwriter, and says, what is the story we're telling? Are we telling a story of Bill with no consequences? Or are we saying something more with it? And they threw the scene away. They basically threw that two-day scene, that expensive, expensive scene. Basically, they have a bit of it in the movie, but not what was in the script. And then Harold Ramis and Danny uh, Rubin, they start writing as to what this movie is going to be. And Harold Ramis says, we want this movie to be about how we use the time of our life. And at the end of the movie, uh, I was at a party at, at Harold Ramis's uh, a little barbecue, and I, and I asked him the question. I, I asked the question, how long was Bill really in the town? How long? And he said, I am a practicing Buddhist. And we believe it takes 10,000 years to perfect a human soul. And that's how long Bill is in the town because the story of Groundhog Day, and here's the answer to your question, is the story of the perfection of the human soul. And so from all of my views before, we're colored by that conversation with Harold. And I've always looked at the film from then on is what do we see in Groundhog Day? And what we see is... Uh, the loss of ego as the scenes repeat and we see service to others to where by the end at the beginning of the movie bill is so busy putting the moves on andy that there's no time for anything else and, the, and he comes off as a jerk by the end he's so busy saving everybody in the town that he doesn't have time to court andy he doesn't have time to make time with her. He's saving the kid falling from the tree. He's saving the mare choking on the stake. Uh, he, he's trying to save the old man, but then he realizes we can't do everything. So even in trying to save everyone in the town, the ladies with the flat tire, everything is in service of others. And that's what makes Andy fall in love with him, is not him putting the moves on her, not money or grace or anything but the fact he is somebody who's going to stick his neck out for other people. He's the kind of guy I want to have a relationship with. And to me, that's the enduring thing about Groundhog Day. It's a magnificent love story because it really is the one of the few movies that give you advice on really how to get people to fall in love with you. It's like, help other people out. Yes, yeah, some of us are in the habit of watching that movie over and over in our own lives. I think it's on brand. Have you seen it a bunch of times too? I, I've seen it. I've seen it not as much as you would think. Uh, I usually am invited to a film festival or something like that where they're featuring it and I'll see it there. I just saw it at the uh, Turner Classic Movie Festival and saw it on the big screen, you know, in Hollywood, which was exciting to see again. I saw it at the Academy. That was remarkable at the uh, so I'm a member of the academy 
uh, you know, so I'm supposed to vote on all these things. And they did a retrospective on films that they love. And one of them was Groundhog Day. And those guys who put it together gathered people who were in the movie and had them on stage. And at one point I was on stage too, and they asked me some questions. But the main thing was the little girl who takes piano lessons, right? All she does is take the piano lessons. Bill Murray comes in and then they kick her out and she's out there. They introduced her and now she's a grown woman. She's 30, you know, 35, 36, 36, I don't know. You know, it's been 30 years that she was how old when she did it? Five, six, seven years old. So she's pushing 40 or something. The audience gave a thunderous applause to her. And then they showed the movie. And when she gets kicked out of the piano lesson, the audience, which is was close, you know, 1,500 people in that Academy screening room, <clears throat> huge theater, Everybody started screaming, clapping, stomping on the ground. It was fantastic. And it's the kind of thing that movie kind of releases in people. And, uh, you know, it was a privilege to be in it. I was glad to be in it. I had a great experience with Bill. Uh, we had a great time working together, great experience with Andy. It was just terrific. Jonathan and myself really liked the movie a lot. We watched it many, many times. But, uh, you know, kind of rewinding, I didn't realize, you know, the first scenes were those uh, sidewalk scenes. Did you have a sense when you were first uh, filming those sidewalk encounters and, you know, the big money behind it was all watching? Could you tell that? Did you feel, did you sense that you were making a classic? God, no. <laughs> <laughs> it was chaos. Because w after that first week, once they start rewriting the script, Scenes are leaving the movie. They're flying out of the movie. New scenes are being written in. We were literally getting pages hot off the press, like hot in your hand. It's like, oh, you could use this as a foot warmer. This They had just written a scene. Okay, let's do this scene. Uh, the scene where Bill hugs me on the street. That wasn't even in the script. <laughs> Harold Ramis set the cameras up and and... We started, and Bill came out and started, hey, Ned, it's been so long since I've seen, are you busy this afternoon? And I'm like, Ugh, and I run away. That was one take. Uh, that was not in the script what Bill did. And, you know, we're going like, let's move on. So you're either thinking, I've been in movies where people have a great time on the movie, and they are usually don't turn out to be good. Yeah, there's something wrong with them. I've been on movies that were terrible and, and, you know, actors didn't show up and you had to shuffle things. Those didn't turn out to be good. I've been on movies that were wars, that were fought, and, you know, Groundhog Day was one of them in that we didn't really have a script. Thelma and Louise was one of them, where Ridley Scott was working on each scene, wanted each scene to have something unique and powerful in it. And everybody, it was just wild shooting that movie. It wasn't like a normal movie. And you think like, it's either going to turn out to be terrible or a classic. And I remember I was walking down Wilshire Avenue. In fact, I think I was walking, parked my car, I was going to the Academy and Ridley Scott came out of a building. He came up, Stephen, Stephen. And, and he came up and hugged me. He says, I just finished editing Thelma and Louise, it's going to be good. It's going to be good. It's a good movie. Even Ridley didn't know. Even Ridley didn't know. So it, it's it, you never know what this stuff. But with Groundhog Day, certainly not. We had no idea that this would be the new Wizard of Oz. And, and the reason is that it's an evergreen and it's so good is it is such a beautiful and enduring love story. And another thing, my theory, personally, is we shot it outside of Chicago in the winter, so everybody's wearing earmuffs and hats and big old coats, and so it's not dated. It's like winter clothes don't date you like having big shoulder pads and crazy hair and all this kind of stuff. So it looks more timeless, I think. So you were a collaborator on another one of my favorite movies, True Stories from 1986, directed by and starring 
David Byrne of Talking Heads. You co-wrote that movie with Byrne and Beth Henley. And I read that you were the inspiration for the song Radiohead, which is sung in the film. Uh, and you were also an inspiration for the character who sings that song. And I guess we could say somehow a secondhand inspiration for the band Radiohead as well. So could you share a little bit about this? Oh, it's it's crazy. It's like I was in love with this girl, Beth. She was a freshman. I was a sophomore and at in college. And uh, so I was always looking for ways to talk to her and things like this. I was, because I was a sophomore in uh, the theater department, I was in a movement class. And for the beginning of the class that year, they wanted to have it out. <clears throat> I forget which lake in Dallas, like Lake Dallas or so one of the big lakes out there, a couple hours away from SMU. And so, you know, it's like 1971, 72, you know, uh, hippies, they were, we knew they were dirty, but at the, this time they still had a great deal of respect. And so, y you know, it was a very hip kind of thing. And so our movement teacher wanted to have this session out by the lake it's at sundown we had a fire in the middle we we're going to do movement exercise now a lot of the class was sneaking off in the woods to smoke something called marijuana and you could smell it everywhere but me i didn't do such things i i was pure and and so the teacher got everybody in a circle at sunset and said uh, we're going to go around in a circle now and i want you all to say the first thing that comes to your mind that, that was creativity back in 1971. Say the first thing that comes to your mind. So Lord of the Rings, the book, not the movie, people were starting to read that, and so they were flipping out over Frodo. So like the, the first guy in, in line goes, Frodo, because the first thing was in his head. So the second person goes, Frodo. The next person goes, Gandalf. The next person goes, Hobbit. That's right. That's right. Now just say the first thing that comes in your mind. Just let it go into your mind. And it's coming around to me and my mind is going blank. I hadn't read the book. I uh, hadn't seen the cartoon or anything. And as soon as it gets to me, I hear this sound in my head, this sound. And, and the teacher says, Stephen, just say the first thing that comes in your mind. And I go, I get the idea that you're not who you say you are. I get the idea that you have an assumed name and that your initials are J.K. or J.L. Pause. As the sun continues to set, then the teacher goes, fine, now next next person, please. I go, and he goes, uh, Golem. And then there, we're back to beer, weed, Frodo, Frodo, Gandalf, as we go around in a circle. And so I'm leaving uh, the other people want to stay and smoke weed sleep be mosquito bait i'm going out to my car to go home and out of the shadows comes the teacher and said why did you say what you said you just said say the first thing that come to you because it's true i have an assumed name and those are my initials now why did you say that i said i have no idea i have no idea but i'm thinking in my head i have something to tell beth I have something to tell Beth. So uh, I get back to Dallas and I go, uh, Beth, um, I, I, have a, I have a story to tell you. And I'm telling her that story in the front seat of my car. And I'm thinking, this could be a good chance of holding her hand because we all were holding hands. And Beth said, can you do it to me? Can you, do I make a sound? Do I make any kind of sound? And I said, I don't know, Beth. Well, hold my hands. And I'm going, oh, yes, yes. So I'm holding her hands in the front seat. And I said, well, I hear a sound, but it's weird. See, most people have only one tone, but you have three tones. And you have three tones in the male range. Usually uh, the males have higher tones than females, and people have one. I don't know what really all these mean. I think the ratio of one to third is means a spiritual union with yourself. And the ratio of one to five is some kind of physical completion. You feel complete as yourself. And she, Beth's eyes lit up and said, we are going to make a fortune. 
We'll be partners. We'll go to the theater department and we'll, you'll hold people's hands. You'll take them. I'll bring them to you. We'll charge them a quarter. We could charge them a dollar for this stuff. You just hold it. And you say stuff like that about the tone and about it being a quarter and the male range and the female range. Just say that stuff. And so Beth and I went into a partnership and we kept the money in a jar. We ended up making about $16, which was princely back then. And we ended up as sweethearts and we ended up with the jar and we never really went into the jar to spend that money. And I think when we broke up, I think I left her with the $16. I'm not sure, but the $16 was still untouched. And so, anyway, we were at the Academy, the same movie theater where I saw Groundhog Day, if we're going to make that connection where we had the big thing. The same movie theater. Uh, Beth and I were doing Pilates in Los Angeles before Pilates was cool. This is where they just had like two Pilates places rather than it's like Thai food now, like every block has a Pilates place. And car pulls up. Jonathan Demi is in the car. And he rolls down the window and says, hey, Beth, Stephen, uh, I have this movie. Stop making sense. I'm just editing it. Uh, we're going to have a rough cut over at the Academy. Want to come with me and watch it? So we go, sure. We come in and it's like I say, a 1900 seat theater. And the only people in there are David Byrne and uh, Tina and, and, and Chris Front, and Jerry. Those are just the talking heads, Jonathan, Jonathan's former wife, Evelyn, Beth, and me. And we're in this huge theater. And David Byrne is sitting kind of behind me, but beside, and I feel his eyes like staring at me to see how I react to this movie. And afterwards, we all go out to eat Chinese food. And David is sitting across from me at the table and says, tell me what's wrong about the movie. I go, well, David, I love, no, no, don't compliment me. Everyone wants to compliment me. I want you to give me your criticism. Give me your criticism of the movie. I go, okay, okay, I have nothing, no criticism. And then he said, do you guys have a pool where you live? And Beth and I, at this point, Beth had won the Pulitzer Prize for drama. And so she had truckloads of money. And so we were living in a house up on the Hollywood Hills. And so we said, sure, sure, we have a pool. He says, well, I'm, shoot, I'm shooting a video of my Road to Nowhere song, and it has water. We want to shoot underwater. Can we shoot at your pool? Me, not thinking anything about insurance or lawsuits or anything like that, say, sure, come on up, you know? So we are in the backyard shooting Road to Nowhere, I decided to barbecue some fish or something for everybody who's around there because I was uh, actually chronically unemployed at the time and spent my time fishing in the great Pacific Ocean. And Beth says, so David, what are you doing next? And he says, well, I'm going to do this movie called uh, True Stories. And it's about all the places, the really unbelievable things that we've run into on the road, these stories that are absolutely ridiculous, but are true. And then Beth said, well, you should talk to my sweetie because he can hear tones. And, and David looks at me and goes, he can hear tones. I, I, David, it was a long time ago. He says, what do you mean you hear tones? I say, well, I hear tones coming from people. And then I can tell you about the person. Like everybody makes these tones. You're kidding. <laughs> so David was a so over the next week, he hires Beth to be the screenwriter of True Stories because she's Pulitzer Pig. She was Pulitzer Prize winner. So she goes over and starts working with David, then comes back two hours later and, and says to me, I have no idea what he's talking about. None. I cannot understand what he wants. But I told him, you're good with structure. Maybe you could go over there and help. So David called me up to come over there, and his wall was covered with all these drawings all over the wall, and he's a very good artist. So these little drawings with pictures that he wanted in the movie, and I took notes for about, you know, hour, two hours again, and I said, well, let me just work on this tonight, and I'll give you something, and if you want to hire me, you can hire me if not. So that night I wrote out an outline for True Stories and wrote about 30 pages of the script and gave it to David. He hired me. And then later uh, he hired Beth 
to also write. And so Beth and I wrote the script for True Stories in 19 days and handed it to David Byrne, and we didn't hear from him for over a year. So I'm like, I figured like, well, this has gone down that great disposal called Hollywood, and we'll never hear anything from it again. I'm riding in my car through the Hollywood Hills, and then I hear knock, 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 knock. And I turn over, there's David Byrne on a bicycle. I roll down the way. Sorry, I haven't been in touch. We were on the road and all sorts of things. We wrote, rewrote the script a lot, but I have something I want you to hear. Are you going to be home today? And I go, well, sure, David. So he came over that afternoon with his guitar, sat down. He said, I wrote this song uh, about your story. And he played Radiohead in my living room. And I went, oh, my God. One of the greatest songs ever. And in a way, it immortalized this crazy episode of my life when Beth and I were in business with me reading people's tones and all this kind of stuff. That was how I ended up involved with uh, True Stories and the, the song Radiohead, which the group on a Friday ended up changing their name from on a Friday to Radiohead. So that was my way into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Steven, in your memoir, My Adventures with God, you describe narrative as the fifth dimension, adding it to length, width, depth, and time. What makes narrative a dimension of its own? What difference does anything makes to any of us without narrative? The only reason why we're taken with length, width, and depth is because science kind of took over schools early, but that really doesn't describe anything to us as people where, you know, like any of these books, y you know, each of these books has a story. But in fact, oh, wait, I see something back here. Who knew if I said I have a book on my bookshelf, who knew that Sigmund Freud wrote a book on jokes? For real. Jokes and their relation to the unconscious. One of my favorite books. Now, Sigmund Freud in that book analyzes human behavior based on the jokes we tell. Narrative. Uh, the story we're telling is really the only thing we have to go by on any day, any good day of the week. In the book, too, you, uh, you talked about being pretty good with math and science and these kinds of subjects. And yet, I think what you're alluding to that, they don't really mean much without the connective tissue of a good story. Right. It, it, well, it means, you know, you could do your taxes, but it doesn't tell you anything about your tax guy. And it doesn't tell you anything about how you earn that money that you're to make those, pay those taxes. That's why when everybody gets down to dollars and cents with things, they're leaving the story out. And for me, what I do is I learned a long time ago that the only interesting story is a true story, not like a funny, goofy story. I can hear a phony story from a mile away because they're not weird enough. And real stories are crazy weird. When you hear them, you, you cannot believe them. I broke my neck in 2008, and there wasn't much I can do. So I started reading one of these books back here, a Talmud. I started reading the Talmud, which I never read. I thought, well, there's nothing I could do now. I'll just read this Talmud. And I began to get into the narrative of the Jewish religion, and I guess that would be a happy thing, whether you're an atheist or not, is because the stories and the meaning of the stories are potent. Uh, they're, they're something we carry with us because we see uh, commonality, something that connects our lives that, that we never expected connects our lives. And usually, it's catastrophe, if you want to take a look at it. Uh, that's another reason why narrative is important, is, is most of the good things in my life came from or immediately following catastrophe. And that's the basis, I think, of a lot of good stories. And uh, whether they're happy or funny or scary or whatever, that, that's, I always go for the catastrophe. Well, this uh, program, Amusing Jews, is a project of a humanistic Jewish congregation, and it's also uh, in collaboration with an 
atheist nonprofit organization. So the title of your book, My Adventures with God, which I have right here. Ah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> it suggests something of a theological treatise, which it really isn't. Uh, it's it's a collection of stories, of, of memories, of reflections, insights drawn from your search for meaning and desire for transcendence with the G word used here and there. So I'm wondering uh, how you would advise a non-believer to go about reading this book and not be scared by the title. Oh, well, well, it just the stories are, most of them are amusing and the ones that aren't are absolutely horrifying. But I... It, the way the, the way the book came about, I had written my first book, The Dangerous Animals Club, and my publisher from Simon & Schuster came out to California. He was having dinner and he invited me over, but I was shooting Californication that night. I was not only shooting Californication, I was shooting a naked scene in Californication that night. So I was going to be involved in an orgy scene by the pool. And so I'm sitting down at Hugo's over in the uh, Hollywood with, with Ben, Lonan, who's brilliant, brilliant editor, wonderful man. And he says, so everybody loves the stories you're telling in your first book, The Dangerous Animals Club, but we always find there's kind of a spiritual bent in your stories, uh, like uh, either a sense of completion or a lesson learned or something to be avoided. There seems to be a spiritual thing at work in your stories. Do you think you could write another book of stories that had spiritual elements, meaning at the end of it. And I said, absolutely, Ben. Uh, and this was when God, I'll use the G word, touch me for sure at Hugo's because I had, I, had, I had to go run and take my clothes off and jump in this swimming pool. I had, it's only so long to talk to my publisher at Simon & Schuster. I said, you know, all of our lives are really like the Old Testament. Uh, first of all, you have the book of Genesis. These are stories about where we came from, what we want to do, our aspirations. It's the stories we usually tell on a first date over the second class of Chardonnay. And if if the date is going well, we even tell that person our apprehensions. That's the book of Genesis. Then all of us go into slavery, like the book of Exodus. Some of us stay in graduate school forever. Then we have the book of Leviticus, where we're out in the desert and we have no idea what the hell we're doing. And we're walking around in circles of what's going to happen with our life. And then we get to the next section of our life, the book of Numbers, where we're touched by mortality for the first time. We lose a father, a mother. We lo lose another family member. And our lives are shaped by mortality. And then, if we're lucky, Ben, we get to the book of Deuteronomy, when we're able to tell our stories to our children, just like Moses was able to tell his story to the children of Israel, because after being in the desert for 40 years, walking around, they had forgotten why they were doing what they were doing. So we get to tell our stories to our children. And Ben goes, that's the book. That's the book. What will we call it? I said, how about my adventures with God? He goes, that's the book, write it. So that's how the book came about right before I went to do a sex scene in Californication. So the only thing I would say to the people who are not religious, I, my, my book is not a religious book. It is a book of true stories that happened to me in which my uh, spirit, my soul was tried, either with joy or with amazing hardship or grief or whatever. Amazing. I have a, a story of me being held hostage at gunpoint in a grocery store uh, and how I got out of it. Of course, I'm here. And then uh, stories of me breaking my neck, riding on a horse on the side of an active volcano in Iceland. I mean, what could possibly have gone wrong? Uh, stories of the very beginning and the end of my relationship with Beth. Uh, heartbreak. Uh but there's a lot of laughs in it, and there's a lot of, oh, my God, I can't believe that really happened. So another story, uh, you wrote and co-starred in a two-character play, A Good Day at Auschwitz, which dramatizes conversations you had with your friend Abe, who was an Auschwitz survivor. Yep. What inspired you to turn those conversations into a play? My mother passed away, and so I was looking for a synagogue where I can do the mourning 
for her because the synagogue was that you're supposed to do 11 months. This, this is one of the religious prescriptions, 11 months every morning, every evening. And you had to have a minion. You had to have 10 people there. And so I decided since I was not working at the time, I was injured at the time, and I, I was unable to work, I will do this. I will do this. What the hell? And I did not grow up a religious Jew. I did not. I thought, what the hell? I'm going to do this. And I got so much from the process of doing that, but a lot of it was meeting the other mourners. And one of the people there was Abe. Abe was a survivor at Auschwitz. I didn't know that at first. I just thought he was the crazy old dude over here who kept asking me, do you want to go to breakfast? And so I had a couple years where I just, I went first to mourn my mother for the 11 months, but then I didn't want to quit going because they needed 10 to meet in the morning to be able to say the prayers. Without 10, you went home. And so I didn't want anyone to miss the opportunity to be able to, to mourn their loved one. Strange thing that you're drawn by one commonality is grief in this little room. It was so powerful. Abe was a guy who was completely filled with joy. And what we would do is after we had this morning session at 7.30 in the morning, we did service, we'd go out and have breakfast. Then Abe started inviting me over to his house, playing cards, him and me playing poker with two people, playing poker with two people. It's a brutal game. And he started talking to me about his life, and that's when I learned he was a survivor of Auschwitz. And for that two years, I, I said, do you mind if I take notes on this, Abe? So I started taking notes on Abe's stories, which are amazing in Auschwitz. And I wrote two stories that are in my adventures with God, uh, the Kaddish and a good day at Auschwitz, which describe my coming to say Kaddish, meeting Abe and our friendship, and then uh, Abe's stories about Auschwitz, which are unbelievable. He fell in love at Auschwitz. How is that possible? Worst place on earth. And he found, uh, it's unbelievable. So anyway, I had written these, and the book came out. And then Los Angeles Theater Works, uh, LATW, uh, contacted me. And they said, have you ever considered maybe turning these two stories into a play? And so I thought, well, I'm still not working, sure. So I wrote, I turned A Good Day at Auschwitz and the Kaddish into uh, A Good Day at Auschwitz, a two-man play with me and the uh, and Abe. So you probably get this question a lot, or maybe not, uh, but do you have any tips for aspiring or struggling actors, and particularly character actors in our audience? I will say no man sets out to be a character actor. The lucky, you know, what I said, we're all framed by catastrophe. You know, it was in sixth grade, I realized I couldn't see the, bo the board, the chalkboard anymore, and I needed these glasses. And so I've had glasses since then. And I used to be a handsome guy, curly locks, all this kind of stuff. But in graduate school, I was playing an 80-year-old man, spraying my hair with streaks and tips for the run of the show, which was like a week maybe a week and a half. And at the end of the run, my hair fell out. And so I ended up with glasses and fairly bald in my late 20s. And I thought, catastrophe, the end of my career. Oh, no, not at all. Not if you're going to be a character actor, because then what it did is it made me look the same for decades. Identifiable. So the audience still sees the same me pretty much when they see me in any show, the kind of almost the same as I would as, was as Ned all those years ago. Uh, so as a character actor, don't kick yourself for having lost that hair or needing glasses or whatever. I would say this. 
uh, if anybody wants to be an actor, it's important to read plays. Not that uh, people do plays that much now, but it's important to understand dramatic structure. And in your head, you get all these kind of parts in your head by reading the play because you just automatically impersonate them and feel your body going into the play. Read plays. Uh, if you're going to always be in acting class, uh, even if you're good at acting, it doesn't matter because an acting class is where you you meet people. Quick story. I think it's a quick story. I hope it's a quick story. Is is uh, first, I got this advice to be in acting class. Even thought I thought I was like one hot shot actor when I was in my late twenties. So I came out to L.A. joined this acting class. The first acting class, someone came in and said, "We're doing this play, Time of Our Life, and we just lost our Dudley. Does anyone want to play the part?" I go, "I will." So you join an acting class, it becomes this matrix of where you hear all about all the things that are happening. So I said, yes, I will be Dudley. And they said, well, come in an audition. We open this week. You only have three days to rehearse, then we do preview, and then the critics come. So I did it. I got the part. I, I did a Thursday night and a Friday night performance, and everything was great. And then Saturday... We heard Fran Bascom, one of the biggest casting directors in Los Angeles. She was doing all the sitcoms and all that stuff, was coming to the show. But here's my chance now. I've come to L.A., I'm in this play, and now I get to perform for Fran Bascom. And I'd been doing pretty good those first two shows. Most of my part as Dudley is on the payphone outside the bar. So I'm just waiting for my girlfriend to call, and I have these monologues with her. The night Fran Bascom is there, I get up for my monologue, and it's going really well, and then the payphone falls off of the wall. So I get down on my hands and knees, and I'm down there, and I keep going with the monologue. I keep going, and then I pick up the payphone in my arms, and they are very heavy. You know, they weigh 40, 50 pounds. And I'm holding the payphone with one hand, and I'm talking with the other, and then the cord that's going into the Telephone receiver falls out of the phone. So now I'm having this receiver in my hand. So I keep going with the speech, and I throw the payphone off stage, and now I'm just talking to a phone with no cord in it. Fran Bascom is in the audience. I, I, I was so humiliated. I had done so well the other shows, and this was the biggest, I don't want to say it, but it was a terrible thing. And it was a horrible thing. I, I was almost too embarrassed to leave the dressing room that night, humiliated. Monday morning, I get a call from Fran Bascom's office. Says, Stephen Tobolowsky, yes. Says, uh, Fran Bascom would like to see you. Uh, you have a, oh, sure, sure, yeah, yeah, of course. I went, saw Fran Bascom. She has a stack of scripts. She says, I want you to look at this script, look at these and see if there's any part in there that you think you, and I'm going like, excuse me, uh, I don't understand. It was terrible. It was terrible. It couldn't have gotten any worse. You know, why Why are you... And she said, Stephen, you're the kind of actor we're looking for, the one who won't give up. So for all the young actors out there, be the one who won't give up. That's my advice. And be on time. Well, thank you so much. That was an, an amazing story, a bunch of amazing stories. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure, guys. My pleasure. And to our audience, now back to your regularly scheduled lives. Amusing Jews is here to amuse you. If you like being amused, go ahead and click like and subscribe. Subscribe.